Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the BH virtual event space. You are tuned in the new age time lapse. Time lapse. Let's get this out, Andrew. Time it's lapse. Great. It's technique. time lapse. Maybe time lasts. Who knows? You know, we can make time it happen. Lapse. Yeah. Well, hopefully, it's not the last. Yeah. Hopefully, it's but, not the last. But the way AI is going, though, maybe it will be. We'll see we what happens. You never know. Look, we have the, the perfect person on for all things that are forward thinking. This is the man, Sony artisan of imagery, Andrew Geraci. You're you're one of those people that's like way ahead of where I'll ever be. So wherever I, okay. whatever you Here's, come on, shut up, Derek. No, come on, <laughs> you, you, you you do all the cool stuff. If you guys aren't aware of what Andrew's mm -hmm. doing out there, yeah, we're gonna get some links dropped. Check out his stuff and just tune in for the next hour and just be amazed. Yeah, just tune in, guys. That's all it's gonna be. We're gonna have fun here. It's gonna be you know, really back and forth with just myself and my other personalities. We're going to have a good time. We're going to talk time lapse, workflow, new age social media. We can even talk pie and gummy bears if you want. So, you know, whatever you guys want. That's what we're going to do. I'm all for it. Apparently, yeah. see, Andrew knows how to talk way better than I do. So I'm going to get out of the way. But I will remind you that you can ask as many questions as you want. Yes. You don't even have to wait until the end. We'll answer them no. during, if you have them during. You don't have to wait to the end. That's the thing. So I want you guys, if you guys have questions out there, uh, feel free to ask at any point. Derek's going to be the voice of God and uh, relay them to me while we're doing that. And that way we can uh, kind of do this in tandem live as we're doing it. Because if you got a question, I want to answer it and make sure you got all that beautiful knowledge ahead of time. Um, but uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Derek, for having me. Thanks, BH. Thanks, Sony. Um, I totally just cut you off. I was just like, hey, I'm just going to start the presentation. That was great. You know that I'm like, wait, how do I sneak out of here? How do, how do you virtually sneak out of the room? Do I? Do That's I a just... good question. What is the virtual sneak off? Is just there like it going is. Black? There you go. You just there did it. it. <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> take it away. I'll see you in a bit. Perfect. Thanks, Derek. All right, guys. Well, welcome. We're going to be talking about new age time lapse workflows uh, into our ever expanding social media. If you're not on Threads, follow me on Threads. <laughs> follow me on every other social media that's out there because, as we know now. The social media world is always expanding, as is all of the tools that we have in our photographic toolboxes, whether that's cameras, lenses, hardware, accessories, you know, we're going to be talking about those today. And I'm really excited for that. If you guys don't know who I am, just wait a second, and I'm going to show you a fun little video. But because Zoom is very uh, finicky, we're going to do this with a share screen, and uh, we'll go that direction, and then we'll bounce back and forth. So just bear with me for two seconds. Ba -dum -bum -bum -bum. Dun, 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 dun. And then yell at me if you guys don't hear any audio, all right? <laughs> did it just stop? It did just stop, but we did hear audio. That's good. Zoom is freaking out on me right Zoom now. Zoom is zooming. I think if you told me 15 years go. ago that I'd be traveling the world and doing what I love and working with people and companies like David Fincher, Steven Spielberg, Dell, Sony, and Netflix, I'm pretty sure I would have called you crazy, but that's where we are. I'm timeless photographer and cinematographer Drew Geraci, and this is my story. My career started when I joined the Navy at 17. I was young, ambitious, and absolutely loved telling stories and photography. It was an outlet for me to share my experiences with friends and family, but it also blossomed into something that even I couldn't imagine at the time. I never would have thought that time-lapse photography could be a career, but after I started doing it more and more, it didn't feel like a job to me. It was just creating art, capturing moments, and making a product, for me at least, that is completely mesmerizing to watch. My journey as a storyteller is never-ending, and it's taking me across the globe. Along the way, I've met hundreds of people, each with a unique story and point of view to share. Through the use of timeless photography, as well as traditional cinematography, I get the opportunity to give back to those whose stories I tell, whether it's for a Hollywood production or just sharing one person's personal journey. Now, these are the moments that make it all worthwhile to me. Sharing my skills, my talent, and my vision to help or promote someone else that needs it. There isn't a moment where I'm not trying to grow as an artist, to learn new things and tackle challenging assignments. I push myself and my gear to the limits most days and often find myself asking, well, what else can I do? With today's cutting edge technology, it makes it so much easier to produce high quality content on the go, which means that I can't wait to see what the next chapter of my life holds. My hope is my journey helps inspire others to go out and explore their own talents and skills because you never know what can happen.
Yeah, you never know what can happen. So we're back now and I'm going to quickly switch back over to another slide. So bear with me one second. And there we go. So if you're into time-lapse photography, or even if you're not into time-lapse photography, there's been a ton of different changes that have been basically evolving over the last couple of years. And obviously as a Sony uh, ambassador, I definitely love using my Sony cameras. Um, in particular, they just added new features and functionalities to the Sony EVZ1, which gives you actually like a full time-lapse mode. That's It's an upgraded SNQ mode, but SNQ stands for slow and quick. Um, and it's really probably one of the easiest ways to capture time lapses. Now, in the past, what I had done, obviously, which I still prefer doing, it's just doing the classic raw photo capturing because it really gives you the full attitude of the camera that you're working with, as well as the resolution um, and just the color quality, as well as um, just giving you better dynamic range um, in certain situations. Um, now, for me, classic is just the way to do it because um, it really gives you much more uh, ability to, if you're looking to do stuff in post, you can you know, crop, reframe, resize, and it really just gives you a boundless or endless, uh, I should say, um, area of uh, workspace to work in. Um, however, comma, there's a lot that goes into new technology. So if you're using something like the A7R5 or the A1, these are huge 8K and 10K resolution files. So you have to have the hardware that's basically gonna be able to support those large resolution files. And when you're talking about uh, combining 400 to 600 or even a thousand of those frames together, um, inside of your NLE, you're going to need a lot of horsepower. So you're going to have to be looking at um, system specs um, that are in that high, it's in that higher price range. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but definitely for me, the classic way of shooting time lapse is the best for any kind of production. But, and as we, uh, I talked about earlier, the new age SNQ mode is really the way to go because it allows you to basically compile the entire time lapse inside of the camera and you can shoot it in a log mode. It's 4K, 10 bit. So you do get a lot of that, you know, beautiful quality. You do lose the resolution um, and, you know, there's fewer interval um, options. If you are shooting SNQ, you only can get only one frame per second and there's no uh, changing for the, the interval. So if you want to actually have like a four second or an eight second or a 10 second interval. So if you wanted to shoot Astro, unfortunately, you can't do that with SNQ yet, um, but I'm hopefully uh, at some point in the future, that's going to change. Um, Sony is always evolving. And I know with new AI technology, maybe we'll be able to get that ability to do that with SNQ. Um, but you do have that ability with your classic mode. So if you do want to shoot astro time lapse photography or anything that requires long exposures um, and long intervals, classic is definitely the way to go. Um, switching back to SNQ, though, we're talking about social media. And in a social media era, we really want to be looking at you know different revenue or different areas that we can take our, our um, our shots and then implement them into the social media, whether that's in a, a nine by 16 um, or just doing center crop, um, which is definitely one of those things that we have to do sometimes. Um, and yeah, so this is a shot that I just did. Um, it was obviously for 4th of July. And it's the first time that I've done this, um, quite honestly, doing it in a professional setting where I was using my Sony A1 with a 50 millimeter lens, but I tilted the camera on a vertical axis. That way the entire composition could be seen in the middle of the frame. I'm not sure if this is gonna play. So let me know if it does or not. Okay, it does. Um, but as you can see here, I can frame up directly where the, um, you know, the composition is in a vertical nine by 16, and it gives me the full frame. So if I'm putting this out to, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, or YouTube uh, shorts, I have all that beautiful composition ready to rock and roll. And I get the ability to, to edit it in post because I'm still getting that 8K resolution. Um, but what I'm doing then is just, you know, obviously just changing, you know, the different compositions and pushing and pulling away from the, um, the scene. Uh, but this really gives you more avenues for shooting social media. And personally, I think there's a lot of changes on the way. And while I'm definitely of the old school mindset of thinking, um, what's it called? You know, we're, we're out here and, uh, you know, 10 years ago, no one would have thought about shooting vertical video and it would have been super taboo, but quite honestly, everything that we're doing today is vertical video. We, we consume everything from our phones. Um, we, you know, are basically living in a social media world. So it's really important that if you're going to start doing shooting, uh, shooting time-lapse, shooting video, shooting any kind of photos is really to make it vertical. And yes, that includes time-lapse. Um, now for this particular one, I did use this in the classic mode. So I was just shooting raw frames and I was compiling it inside my NLE. Um, it's difficult to do night shots with the SNQ mode because you only get obviously one frame per second and the exposure can be a little bit tr uh, tricky to get. Um, so that's when I think you wanna switch back over to the classic. But when you're recomposing uh, for nine by 16, it really does give you a lot of uh, latitude to work with in post two if you are shooting higher resolution footage. That way, if you aren't shooting nine by 16 and you're shooting 16 by nine, you can do a little center crop 
in your, your frame. You just want to make sure that when you are framing up your shot that you have a nice center cut portion. That way, when you do move into that vertical realm or space inside of your NLE, it's going to look crisp and beautiful and the composition will be there. So always think about that when you're going out shooting for your social media posts. All right, so I'm going to go back here. Um, and one thing that I found specifically inside of um, the social media settings is if you're looking for a video that you know wants to go viral, it wants to get picked up, it's not about creating just a single time lapse. It's about creating multiple time lapses. It's about creating a story within that time lapse. Obviously, within you know 30 seconds is probably your your best bet. Um, but this is probably one of my first event uh, time lapses that I did, and it was for Halloween. And what's funny about this is I really didn't take too much effort or care <laughs> into like producing it. Um, however, comma, uh, I put it together and within just like a matter of maybe um, eight or nine hours, uh, it got around 25, 30,000 um, views, which is pretty impressive, uh, especially since I don't really have a very large following uh, on my Instagram account. But just doing short videos like this that show you the progress going from start to finish um, really allows the viewer to get engaged with what you're doing. And it also makes it so that it becomes more popular and um, guess what's the word, more uh, broad with your audience. And that way you can expand beyond just, you know, photographic areas. You can go into the, the wider Halloween party events, themes, holiday seasons, things like that. Um, and that's really what's, what's engaging. And I've definitely found that if I take time lapses from previous projects and bring them into the, the forefront and just do like single shots, I'll get maybe a couple thousand views on them, but it's nothing that's monumental. So I think it's really important that we do storytelling um, and when we actually like move into the, uh, the social media phase of things, because I've learned quite a few things in the past six months. And I have to say that I am, um, I was never really for social media and I was always against it, but really there's a lot of positives to it. And if you are consistent with it, you can definitely become very successful. All right, so we'll go back here. Boop, boop. And we're gonna talk about old school mindsets. And like we were talking about earlier, uh, where I was coming from a 16 by nine world and shooting vertical video, we have to realize that everything that we do today, again, is being consumed on our phones and being consumed on devices that are in a nine by 16 um, field. And you really can't rely on um, things that maybe worked for you 10 years ago to work in today's age, just because everything is changing so quickly. The introduction of AI, the introduction of all of these different services, and quite honestly, all these different social media platforms that you have to um, basically perform for have really changed the game for professionals, amateurs, and everyone in between. Um, if you're looking to become an influencer, if you're looking to become a professional photographer, or you're just looking to you know, get your work out there, it's really important that you um, start doing a lot of different things within the social media realm, which we'll talk about in a second, um, because it's really going to be beneficial to you um, in the future, especially if you're looking to land jobs with clients, if you want to get um, sponsorships, or if you just want to meet new people and collaborate. So uh, one of the biggest things right now is if we take a look at what happened in 2013, you know, there was only 3.5 million photographers out in the world. And that's, you know, it seems like a lot, but it's really not that much. But compared to today, everybody that has their cell phone, everybody has, you know, their brand new Sony cameras um, and everything in between, there's 2.1 billion photographers that in some way, shape or form are producing and putting out content and could be monetizing that content. So the market is super saturated. So you really have to think about ways that you can uh, overcome this by being very unique, being very niche um, and doing something that's you know, creative to you. Um, and that being said too, a lot of the, uh, the content that's being created is just being created directly from the phone. It's not being used by um, you know, professional cameras or even prosumer cameras, it's your phone. Um, and for me, and we'll swap out of here really quick is, um, and this is going to be a product upsale here, but so I use the Sony um, uh, Xperia Pro I, and it's probably my favorite phone um, that I've ever had because it has a one inch sensor um, for the camera and it gives you a, a real photo button sensor here too. Uh, and I've had this as my main phone for the last two years. And quite honestly, I've created a lot of content where I'm just like, why did I even bring out my big camera? Because I can consume everything that I need or capture, I should say, with this guy. Um, and the image quality looks absolutely insane, especially because it's got a one inch sensor in it. You're gonna get much better resolution, much better detail and much better quality um, than you would with your iPhone or your, your Galaxy phone or anything like that. Um, and I have all of the other phones too. I've got an iPhone and I've got a Galaxy phone. And I have to still say the Sony phone has the best pictures I've ever used. Um, and I know that 
there's probably um, a lot of folks that are maybe hesitant to try it. And I can say the same thing when I was, uh, when the A7S uh, first came out and the first Sony camera, cause I was a Canon uh, operator at the time. And when I tried the Sony A7S for the first time, it blew my mind. And the same thing can be said for uh, the Xperia Pro I. Um, I'm sure they're gonna have a second variant or version of this coming out pretty soon because this phone's about two years old and they haven't refreshed it yet. Um, and I can only imagine what improvements they're gonna make on it. But if you are in the market for a new cell phone and you want something that's gonna be able to capture incredible video and incredible photos, um, definitely check out the Xperia Pro I. That's the end of my sales pitch for that. So <laughs> please don't hate me. All right, we're going to go jump right back into here. Um, but we also have to look at the cost of everything that we're consuming these days. Um, every, let's just say every six months, there's new cameras, there's new lenses, there's, there's new technology that's coming out there. And it's really important that as photographers that we think sensibly when it comes to, you know, purchasing gear. Like, do you want something that's older and maybe out of date? Or do you want something that's newer and going to last longer? And do you want to in invest in lenses that are going to help you along the way? And for me, I think the easiest area or the easiest answer for that is to actually say lenses are probably your best choice when you are purchasing any kind of camera gear and to go with, you know, high quality lenses over high quality camera bodies because the lenses themselves are going to last you, let's just say a decade or so minimum. Um, the bodies, though, are probably going to be obsolete within three to five years, um, depending on what brand or not brand, but what you know, model or version you're going with. Um, so it's important that you invest in the lenses. And I'll say that that's definitely one of the things that I've found over my 20 years of, of shooting is that lenses definitely make um, the best investment. Um, and that being said, if you are somebody that really loves going out there and purchasing bodies, you can purchase bodies, do up sales, up trades on them, and you can just keep going and going and going. And that's a great way to do it. Um, now, we also want to talk about what's impacting photography these days, and that's AI imagery. If we know anything about what's happening um, in the landscape here, AI imagery is just taking over. So with uh, Adobe's uh, generated fill, with mid-journey and stable diffusion, we have all of these new assets where you can basically create an entire composition out of thin air and have the computer design it for you. Or you can literally go into photos that you've already had, remove things, and then you can also um, what's it called? You can add things, you can do whatever you want. And it's really, I think there's a lot of benefits to it, but I also think that it's ultimately going to crush a lot of photographers in the long run, because it's going to give everybody an equal playing field to create really beautiful, really magical shots that quite frankly, won't really ever exist in the real world. That's why I do think it's still important that as photographers and cinematographers that we go out there and we still capture things naturally as they really are. And I think it's all right to go out there and um, you know, remove certain things or add certain elements if it helps enhance the original image. But creating an entire image based off of nothing and or other people's works, I'm not really a big fan of. Um, it's great for doing any kind of like storyboarding or just concept ideas, but I think it's really important to go out there and still do traditionally through the, the actual camera. Um, and now we also have to think about the influencers. And this is one thing that I noticed about when I was at camera camp for Sony uh, back in March. Uh, is that there was all these different con or, uh, influencers out there and content creators. And what was amazing to me is that there is millions and millions of people following these folks. And I don't mean this in a negative way, but a lot of the influencers really don't have a photographer's background. They don't have all of the information or knowledge that goes into the hardware um, or you know, thinking about the different types of features and subsystems, whether it's you know, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, uh, dynamic range. It's really about just creating content. And I think it's a really interesting thing because we're now coming to an age where we have professionals that are, you know, they're, they know what their, their tools are, they know their craft, but then we also have people that, that don't know what the tools are and their craft are, but they're kind of merging together in this one realm, which is the social media world. And that's where we all kind of have to get together and really, um, you know, kind of join hands in a way because the influencers and the professionals really can work together to create this kind of utopia where you have someone that's very full of knowledge um, on the, the hardware and technical side. And then you have another person that's very, you know, maybe has a better personality or has the ability to, um, to market things better. And when you combine those two together, you create synergy and you create a really good collaboration. Drew, I wanted over. to jump in real quick. I don't know if you're yeah. going to get into this later, but we did have a couple people asking about making money with time lapses. So I figured making well, money, the cost, who would, who would ever want to make money? Who would ever want to make money in time lapse? 
So yes and no. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been selling and licensing time lapses since I started doing this. And I'll tell you that the industry has changed completely almost overnight in the last maybe two years or so. Um, 10 years ago, I could sell um, single time lapse shots anywhere from $3,500 to $10,000 just for a single shot. And now I think with the advent of all of these subscription based services like Artlist and uh, Film Dissolve and Adobe Stock, the price unfortunately is plummeting. And you're basically going to be scraping by with just pennies, uh, unfortunately. Um, I think if you are trying to sell your work, whether that's through stock agencies um, or even through your own website, is to do it direct sale through your own website, set your prices. And I would say go for rights managed. This is going to be a totally different conversation, but rights managed versus royalty free. Um, there's a huge difference there because rights managed is going to give you so much more money and opportunity to sell those at a higher rate. Um, but the industry itself as a whole, everyone's trying to get away from rights managed because they don't want to basically be paying for yearly subscriptions to your work is what it comes down to. So they're going to go for that royalty free, but in the same instance, you can use royalty free and still set your prices higher. Whereas something like um, the subscription services that are basically charging 25 cents for a video, um, there are services where you could be making you know, 200 to maybe $300 per sale. Um, but if you do that directly through your website, that's going to be the best way to generate revenue. Uh, the next way you can do that is if you shoot time lapses of landscapes or buildings and whatnot, is actually go out there, contact those different um, organizations or corporations and pitch them ideas and saying, hey, you know what, I've got this you know, great time lapse of your building. Are you guys, would you guys like to use it for marketing? And then set up a conversation where you're like, hey, I'll come out and do all of these buildings for you or the architecture or whatever that is that you're, you know, you're, you're doing the time lapse up and then set a price and go that direction. As far, going back to the original question, as far as you know, licensing time lapses, I'll say that it's on a very big decline right now. Um, you can still do it, but the market is so oversaturated because as I was talking about earlier, if you're using the S and Q mode, you can literally create a, a basic time lapse instantly, port it out of your camera, upload it to a stock site, and yeah, it's done. But it's oversaturated, the market and in all fields, not just time lapse, uh, aerials, high speed. Um, models like it's we're, we're we're coming to a point now where there's so much to consume that there's really little um, monetization options unfortunately but with that there can also be monetization options through sponsorship and um, just views on youtube shorts um, and i will say youtube has been a great source you can monetize your content there and if you are doing time lapses create a story with it tell tell the behind the scenes of what's happened how did you get the shot and that way you can at least get the ad sense from that and YouTube will start paying you for that. And that's a way to monetize your content. But the game has definitely changed dramatically over the past 10 years. Hopefully that answered the question. Awesome, wonderful information. Was there any other questions? I saw a couple other pop-ups. We, we, we do have others. I didn't know if you want me to just kind of scatter them in because we had questions about uh, your settings. Is there any particular settings that, and how, I guess I'm, I want to piggyback on that. And how is your settings for different like how do when you go into approaching settings, how is it different for a time lapse versus if you were just taking one still frame? So that's a very intricate question, and it's probably the best and worst question that could ever be asked because there's no <laughs> there's no one setting that's going to give you a perfect time lapse. Um, but the idea is you have to go in and anticipate what's going to happen in your scene. If you're just shooting in broad daylight and you're only going to be shooting for an hour. I would say just set your camera to whatever your normal exposure is. Um, but one thing that I, I, I always try to um, instill in folks is if you want to make your stuff look cinematic is to make sure you use ND filters and drag your shutter or create slow shutter speeds. Um, shooting at 0.5 seconds to one second during broad daylight is going to give you absolutely beautiful um, cinematic looking time lapses. You're going to get a little bit of motion blur from whatever the objects are moving. And if you have things like trees or plants in your foreground, it's going to give them some of that vibration love. Um, and really just blur them and it's just going to look beautiful. Um, so I would never in any time lapse situation really never have your camera go above 1 20th of a second. Always use ND filters, uh, stop that light down and make sure that you are uh, basically, you know, slightly dragging the shutter. That way you can create that motion blur and that's going to ultimately give you the best um, results. Now, if we're talking about how do you anticipate for, let's say you're doing a day into night. Well, the camera technology has advanced so much in the past five years that you don't really have to manually change it anymore. But what you can do is throw it onto aperture priority. You can use a variable density ND uh, filter, which I absolutely love doing. And as the the camera or as the the time is 
elapsing through your, your shot, you can actually move the ND filter one stop every time that the camera actually registers it going down one stop. And you basically create a step down motion where you'll get this beautiful transition from day into night or night into day. And you can still maintain that shutter speed um, dragging. So you'll never have to either go above 1 20th of a second, but you could keep it down in that one second, two second, three second realm. And that's gonna really give you a beautiful um, array of options when it comes to time-lapse. Now you can't do that in S and Q mode, but you can do that um, inside of your standard classic um, intervalometer mode. All right, can we sneak one more quick one in while we have the pause button pressed? Let's, let's do it. Let's, let's make do it. it happen. How, how do you pick your locations? Picking locations is probably one of the, the best parts of time-lapse because it's really about going out during the time of day that you want to shoot and really just observing uh, what you know you see. Um, I do have a, this is going to be a plug for my uh, time-lapse course, but if you are interested in actually understanding different uh, areas on how to shoot and where to shoot with scouting, uh, I've got a course on mz.com. Uh, but at the same point, I will happily answer it right now. But when you are looking for a composition, you want to be looking for three different areas of motion. The more motion that you can capture inside of your frameage, um, or the scene, the more interesting and the more dynamic your shot is going to be. Um, so if we're talking about that, let's just talk about you're shooting a, shooting a city shot, you have cars, people, clouds, um, and exposure or shadow changes. So that's five different things right there. And when you uh, find that composition, look for leading lines, look for reflections. I love reflections. I just shot this really beautiful shot uh, in Crystal City. And it's this really beautiful building that's 100% mirrored glass pardon me, um, there was some beautiful puffy white clouds happening, but there were all these different angles of the clouds coming. So what I did is I set my camera up directly on the angle of the building itself. That way there was a passage on the left, a passage on the right, and reflections on all angles. And that way when the clouds are passing by, it actually looks like the clouds are coming from every single different direction. Um, and that's really gonna give you a really beautiful and very intricate and very detailed looking time-lapse. So I always say when you are looking for time-lapses, make sure that you're looking in every direction, not just in front of you, look down, look up, find puddles on the ground that you think you can shoot um, or reflections off of glass anything that just creates an interesting composition. And much like setting up for a standard composition, um, you still want to anticipate what could happen. So if you're shooting somewhere that's like by the ocean, anticipate a lot of birds in your frame. And if you've ever shot time lapse before, birds are like your number one enemy. So really go out there and see what's in that scene, see what's happening. Um, and you want to be able to uh, basically for fortune tell what's going to happen. So if you know you're in a scene where you there's birds or birds have been or frequented before, you probably want to change your settings a little bit. So you're dragging the shutter more so those birds disappear or just pick a whole new location in general. Um, but there's a lot of different apps. You can use the, the Sunseeker app, PhotoPills, um, my, uh, my Sunset. So if you ever want to know if the Sunset's going to be good, I highly recommend that app because it's fairly accurate. I'd say it's 75% of the time. It's almost spot on. Um, that was almost like a, a, a an anchorman joke. 75% <laughs> of the time it works all the time, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, but what I will say is if you can use different tools to, uh, you know, figure out where the sun's going to be or where the moon's going to be. So if you're trying to create a specific composition, use those tools to help you out. Um, but time-lapse is no different than just setting up for a, a regular still frame. So, um, yeah, but if you're interested in learning more about the actual scouting techniques, check out my class on mz.com. Uh, all right. Anyway, sorry about that. Thanks, Derek. Uh, what is the, uh, the next question? That is it. We'll, we'll let you carry on. Perfect. All right. Back to the PowerPoint. Hey, look, guys, traditional photography and cinematography is dead. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not really dead. But what we will find is that there is a, a much larger draw for uh, quantity over quality these days, which is the opposite of when I had first started doing this. It was all about you know creating quality products, creating something that's engaging, creating something that um, you know looks professional. Whereas, you know, I've seen a photo that someone or a time lapse that someone took with a, a GoPro and it's like the most janky looking GoPro footage you've ever seen. But because there was something interesting happening in that GoPro footage, it got a million views. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. It, it's just telling the story. And the story is the most important part when you are capturing um, any content, whether that's for a time lapse or high speed aerial, whatever you want to do it. Um, the content and the story are the most important. Um, the next thing when we are talking about, you know, in this new world is the consistency. I hate to say it, but you literally have to post every day. Um, and sometimes 
multiple times during the day. And the more you are consistent with it, the more you're consistently going to see your base grow. You're going to see um, engagement grow. You're going to see a lot of different things happen with your work. You're going to see people commenting on your work. You're going to see people giving suggestions and whatnot. And that's how you start growing as a social media influencer, as a social media um, photographer, um, and even as a professional photographer, because ultimately, how consistent you are in social media basically relays that to the sponsors and or the corporations that are looking for that content. And that's how you're basically going to get noticed. And that's how you're going to um, take yourself and elevate yourself from whatever position you're currently in into hopefully a better position. And of course, it's being authentic. And one thing that I've learned in the past, just the six months, honestly, is that you can't fake it anymore. You really just have to be authentic. If something's going wrong or something's going bad, tell people about it. Share your um, your misfortunes as they're happening, share your successes as they're happening. Because one thing that people love, uh, and I will say um, this kind of hits home for me, is they just love the behind the scenes versus the actual finished product. And I'll say I get far more views and far more likes and hits and everything else um, just kind of showing the process of how to get a shot than actually showing what the finalized shot is. And as much as we are as artists and um, you know, uh, we love our work and we want people to enjoy the work that we create. People definitely enjoy seeing what the process is to get the, the final product, then they actually do care about that final product. So be authentic with yourself when you're out there. If you're making mistakes, share that you made a mistake, but then also share how you solve that mistake or solve that issue. Um, and that's going to really um, allow the, the viewers and the folks that are watching your content to really engage with you and be like, oh, I, that's relatable. You know, I've lost my lens cap a million times too. Or um, yeah, you know, uh, I've, I've dropped the camera off a building before because I was an idiot and didn't put, uh, you know, safety restraints. By the way, that's never happened. So um, that's just a terrible, terrible thing to happen. Always use safety restraints. Um, but just be authentic, basically, is what it comes down to. Oop. So we're talking about the way that we communicate to one another. And one of the things that I learned, especially at this uh, camera camp that I just went to, um, it's creating better content, finding the audience that you actually want to communicate with. Um, and then creating a workflow that makes it super easy for you to produce the content. Because the last thing you want to do is make every shoot super complicated and you want to be able to do something in a reasonable amount of time. When you're creating a reel or creating a story, um, think about maybe spending an hour, maybe two hours max putting that together. Um, now, this could obviously vary depending on what kind of content creation you're doing. But if you're just creating very simple 15 second, 30 second spots, um, just think about creating like a list of things that you can do or things that you've used before in the past and putting those together and really just making them um, work for whatever the content is that you're producing. Um, now, when we're talking about our audience, hashtags are super important and also no one cares anymore. So it's really back and forth. We had someone from Instagram talking to us and, talk, and basically telling us all of the, the little secrets of what were happening. Um, but if you are interested in using hashtags, don't use any more than five, but three are the op or three is the optimal number um, that you should be using uh, because that's going to basically give you a very direct and very narrow um, audience choice. And the more you can actually connect with who the audience is that you want to connect with, the more likely that your content is going to go viral or at least get picked up in a way that it'll be fed through the algorithm and then given a chance at life somewhere on that social media platform because ultimately that's really what you want as a photographer and a cinematographer is to have your content be seen so unfortunately there are a, a bunch of different rules that you have to think about and again you have to do a lot of consistent posting and tagging um, but the metadata is super important too when you're creating uh, the descriptions of what you want put a really nice story at the bottom in your description of you know what what's happening in the scene how you got there and then engage with a question um, to your audience you know talk about like hey has this happened to anybody else or share your side of the story of, of what's happened um, and that's how you begin to engage with your audience and your got your your audience it's like oh you know I've, I've had this issue too and then that's again where you're going to start building those followers and then people are going to recognize your work which is always great. And I think as artists and photographers, we, we love having our work be seen and noticed. Um, and it's, it's a good feeling. So um, we were talking about simplifying the workflows too. So I will say that I have my little social media, uh, I don't even know what you wanna call it because it's really tiny um, workflow put together. But basically I write a list of everything that I wanna do or accomplish. I'll you know, write out you know, 10 different real ideas for the week. I'll do two reels a day. 
um, I'll you know find a very easy way to do that, whether that's if it's content that I've already created, which we'll talk about in a second, um, I'll utilize that. Or if I want to go out and create new content, how to, uh, to maximize that and then how to start engaging with uh, corporate sponsors as well, because that's super important too. So if you are somebody that uses a bunch of different equipment, uh, whether you're using lighting equipment, you'll PowerPoint. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. All right. That's all right. My face isn't that good looking anyway. So let's, we'll just, <laughs> we'll keep it on the old uh, PowerPoint. All right. Awesome. So we're talking about storytelling and it's all about connecting, inspiring and engaging because ultimately that's what we want to do with people. We want to make them feel good about what they're seeing. We want to make them um, engaged with what you're actually creating and we want them to go out there and do that. And that's why I always think it's important that whatever content you're putting out there, it has a purpose. It's going to tell some kind of story. It could be a two second story. It could be a 30 second story, whatever you want. But basically the more interesting that you can make it and the more um, you know, engaging to the point where like someone's like, oh, hey, that's a really cool idea. Maybe I can do a twist on it by per performing it this way or, you know, doing whatever you want in that regard. Um, it really gets them motivated to go out more. And then you're creating this kind of web of um, different people that, you know, are inspired by your work, sharing your work, emulating your work. Um, and it's really it's just this like beautiful um, network of, uh, of people. And really that's what we wanna do in today's world is just create a really nice relationship between um, photographers, audiences, cinematographers, and social media influencers, everything. That way we're all connected um, and we can all work together to create um, something magical in the end. So um, one of the things that I have found is repurposing old material really works really well. Um, there is an instance where uh, I have this video, basically it was for Corona Extra and um, it was a three minute video and I turned it into this really fun little um, 30 second video. And this was just a few months ago. And after about a day or so of it going there, it decided to go viral and it's got about a million views on it right now. Um, but I think it's, it's just really kind of interesting to see um, how you can take content um, that is old and then you can bring it to life and really kind of show viewers um, something that you've worked on or were proud of in the past and that you can then reshow um, and do that. So let's try this really quick. So this is the video that I did. Um, and basically what I did is I talked about some of the challenges that were happening in the video. And I went through all the different aspects of whether or not, like, could this be done? How can we do it? And I'm explaining all of these different challenges and I'm not really showing what the shot is the entire time, but it's just the backstory of how we achieve the final shot. And it's, you know, using these different behind the scenes moments, honestly, the video sucks. Um, the, the quality isn't that great, but it's very authentic because it looks like it's, you know, taking with your cell phone and people are giving them their genuine reactions. And it's not until the end that we, I actually show what it is that we're capturing, but that's the payoff. And it's that payoff that really gets people excited and it really makes them want to share. Um, but for this particular project, it's almost you know, 10 years old now, but 10 content from 10 years ago can be re, uh, you know, monetized or reused today. Um, and you can get thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views on that content. So if you have a lot of projects that you're working on or had worked on in the past and you really want to like, bring them back up, you can freshen them up in a new way, tell the story, make it exciting, make it interesting. And then hopefully with a little luck, you get a little love from uh, the social media community and then your, your stuff will go viral. And then you'll make millions and millions of dollars and repeat the process over and over again until you're completely burnt out. It's great. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> That's what's happening. But we also have to think about the, uh, the tools that we use um, to grow. And again, I love using my Sony cameras. Um, I've honestly been using the Sony A1 for the last two years as my main go-to camera. And um, it's important that the gear that you're using, whether that's cameras, laptops, lighting, whatever it is, is equipment that you're familiar with, comfortable with, um, and that also you know, does yield a, a good result. Um, and for me, I definitely want to make all, make sure if I'm especially out in the, the real world is I want to keep myself lightweight. And I, that's why I kind of love my, my A1 as with the A7R5 um, and even the new 50 millimeter lens because Sony has kind of redone all of their lenses as of late and they're coming in much lighter and much more compact and just so much more easier to travel with. Um, and I absolutely love it. And especially for time lapse, if you're hiking out somewhere that's like two or three miles away and you want to capture beautiful imagery, you don't want to be lugging around a 50 pound bag. So a 45 pound bag is even better. Um, so we're coming down. 
Uh, and we're going to go into talking about software. Software, for a lot of the stuff that I'm using, um, it's going to mainly be used on uh, the, um, what's it called, the desktop apps. So I use DaVinci Resolve for doing all of my post-processing. I did just see a comment come in talking about processing, so I see you there. Um, we can definitely talk about workflows um, and processing, but I definitely use DaVinci Resolve for pretty much 100% of my time-lapse work. So um, straight from raw into uh, DaVinci Resolve and then exporting it out, whether that's in a 16 by 9 or 9 by 16 format. Um, but then what I do do is I will take that content that I produce there and I'll bring it into something like Canva, Adobe Rush, or VN Editor um, and put on some like social media tweaks there because sometimes it's actually advantageous to use the, the phone app software versus the desktop software because it actually talks and communicates and produces better quality um, with Instagram and other social media platforms. Um, and then this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with the behind the scenes. And it's super important that you make sure that your followers and the people, whoever your audience is, can see what you're doing consistently, post stories, post, you know, fun little antics that you're doing um, to get them engaged. That way, when the final product does come out, that they're ready to go, they'll see it and they know that you're out there producing that content. So this is another one. I am going to share my screen really quick. Hopefully the audio comes through. If it doesn't, I apologize. One of the most magical places I've ever Another been example. has to be South Africica. Africa. I called up to film a new intro for PBS's Nature, and my team and I flew 27 hours and drove nearly 10 just to find the perfect acacia tree near Botswana. Along the way in our search for the tree, we saw a ton of wild animals, giraffes, elephants, lions, everything. It took us nearly two days of driving down dirt roads in the bush to find the perfect tree, and when we did, we made pure magic. Because there's no light pollution out there, we were absolutely amazed by the stars and were treated to a dazzling spectacle of the universe. Definitely one of the top 10 projects I've ever had the pleasure of working on. One of the most magical places I've ever been. And that's, again, one of the, the fun ways of repurposing material. Um, and it really just allows you to take content you've created before and allows you know the people, your audience, to see what you actually did to create it. And it's very simple to do. And as long as you have B-roll and someone, you know, shooting behind the scenes while you're doing that, you can definitely create a lot of really cool, really fun content. Bum, bum, bum. I think one of the strangest. I don't think that's going to be. Uh, we're going to talk about workflows. I know we're short on time here, so I apologize about that. Um, think about using a different. If you're into you know using desktop technology i will say that using davinci resolve is probably my number one use next you can probably use uh you know adobe after effects or premiere pro and those are all really great choices um really it just comes down to making sure that the output quality that you're creating is good enough to be used on social media which pretty much anything is good for your social media it doesn't even matter if it's you know old footage from 1993 um, but you want to make sure that you're editing it and putting it together in a, you know, almost like a template format so that it's very easy for you to do and operate when you're going into post-production. That way you're not really scrambling around or trying to create new elements. Just create a, a temp folder that you can basically drag and drop certain elements into, and that way you can make um, the content much easier to deliver um, to whatever social media platform that you're looking for. Um, and captioning. Captioning is huge. Captioning is something that I haven't done very much in my line of work and it really wasn't until maybe the beginning of this year that i started captioning but i saw a huge user uptick uh, especially on my time lapse behind the scenes stories and even my video stories um, but the more captioning that you add and the more description to those um, the, the actual bottom line footer descriptions you're going to get a lot more engagement with the people and the content that you or not content but the people um, and the, um, the sponsorships that you want to get and it's definitely one of those things that the more authentic you are, even in your captioning, um, the more engaging you'll be with the social media people. Um, and then of course, tag as many people that you can, or as many collaborators, or as many people or corporations that would be, you know, interested in what you're shooting in your your videos. That way, you'll get you know responses back from those folks, and potentially you can monetize the content and or even get sponsorships that way. Um, and I've definitely seen a huge uptick in that. I will say a lot of the brands that I'm getting contacted for are really off-brand Chinese companies and whatnot that are trying to get their products out there, but you got to start somewhere. And if you're putting that content out there, then that at some point will hopefully uh, lead to larger corporations that will give you, you know, brand new computers or cameras or lighting and fun stuff like that. Um, so this is kind of my routine for creating footage um, and creating my reels is, um, you know, every day I'll come up with multiple ideas, just take my morning, I get up around 6am, 
and I'll have a, a nice cup of tea. And then I'll think about the content that I wanna create and organize it in folders. And by you know, 10 a.m., I'm executing that information um, or executing those ideas and putting them to work. And then basically engaging with followers, taking a little mental health break after that, I go for like a, nice, a nice long walk, play with my cats, all that fun stuff. Um, and then in between there, if I have a shoot or I have something um, that's a paid gig or something in that, I make sure that I have content ready to rock and roll. That way, if I'm out on a shoot or something, I can literally just paste that content or post that content um, via um, a scheduler. And that way I'm always engaging at least something new while I'm working at the same time. And I will say it's super important that you try to learn something new every day if you can. I mean, even if it's a small thing, you learn a new setting, you learn a new um, way to uh, accomplish something that maybe you've never accomplished before. But the more that you learn and the more um, that effort you put into learning, the more you will grow as a photographer, as a storyteller, and just as a human being in general. Um, and I will say books are great. You know, YouTube videos are great. Anything that you can gain information from someone else or someone who's done the process, it's really beneficial to you. And for me personally, I love listening to different podcasts and uh, reading books and just trying to find ways to create new content that I've never created before and then figuring out how to do that. And then at the end of the day, it's collaborate. Go out there with your friends, find other social media influencers, other photographers, and get them working with you together on a different reel or a different post or something in that nature. And with time-lapse, there's a lot of different options that you can do out there, whether you're collaborating with other time-lapse photographers, or you could time-lapse with audio or sound engineers or musicians so that you're creating collaboration between the music and the visuals that you're putting together. And that's a great way to go out there and create something that's new and interesting um, because that's the name of the game though. But realistically, you want to make sure that you are working with other people because the more people you network with, the larger you're going to grow as well as they will. And you just create this beautiful synergy um, of, of inspiring people and just making a, a beautiful, beautiful world, honestly. And thank you guys very much. Uh, I'd be on camera right now, but my camera is dead and uh, I appreciate it. But if you guys want to check me out at district7.com, we are doing a website revamp. So it's down at the moment, um, but you can catch me at Drew Giggity uh, on Instagram and threads as well as, oh my gosh, uh, YouTube shorts, everything else. Uh, if you guys want to get in contact with me, it's just info at district7.com uh, or hit me up on Facebook. I always answer questions um, and I'm happy to um, answer some right now if you have any. Awesome. Well, Drew, they're stuck looking at my face, so I apologize for that, everybody. Beautiful. But, uh, your face is, a, is, is uh, it's a work of art, Derek. So that's, I think that's because you helped me light it in the green. You know, we were, we were talking yeah. about Drew is directing me how to get the best look for, for my face. So thank you to Drew for that. Uh, we do actually have some some questions that we can sneak in before we let you go here today. Um, Let's do it. Does using a slider make a better time lapse or just a more polished movie? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. I mean, a slider definitely gives more impact and creates a more dynamic scene because it's going to give you something that's much more cinematic to look at. You're creating perspective motion, whether that's pushing or pulling away from the scene. And especially when you're talking about time lapse, it's something that you normally can't do with just a regular slider. It's something that has to be done over an extended period of time. The slider has to move at a specific rate of speed. And it's all those different elements that then make that shot magical. So I, I think from a, just from a, a visual standpoint, I do love motion control photography over just a standard stationary um, shot. Um, and if you have that option to do a motion control shot, do a motion control shot um, and just make sure you drag the shutter because that's going to make it even more cinematic. Okay. And this, this next question resonates so heavily with me because <laughs> I haven't, I haven't taken a dive into time-lapse. You, you've got me so interested and in I want to, but I have the same question as our next viewer. It's asking, what is the average time for a time-lapse shoot? And what's the longest time lapse you've done? Uh, I would say the average time lapse, you're probably looking anywhere from 25 minutes if you're shooting something like clouds or people because you're not going to be spending too much time. You'll have a shorter interval anywhere between one to two seconds. And if you're shooting somewhere between 400 and 600 frames, that's going to be you know somewhere between 20 to 30 minutes, somewhere in that range. Um, now, when it comes to long time lapses, um, there was a project I worked on Apple with where we had a, actually, I, I have, to, I have to recant that, guys. I can't talk about that. Um, there's another, there was a project that I was working on, um, and it was a two year project. And um, that was a very interesting project because you basically had to use remote um, camera operators and remote cell phone services to basically trigger the camera, to monitor the camera. And it was a really interesting shot. The shot itself will never 
unfortunately see the light of day, but it was really cool and really exciting. And um, yeah, I mean, there's so many different variables with time lapse and how long you can actually shoot, but I would say um, anywhere from like a couple of months to even a couple of years is definitely something that I've done and spin my wheel well. Right. And there was a follow-up yeah. question on that, asking about the battery issues. How do you, how do you deal yeah. with power? In power is always an issue. Uh, I will say that we are, when we are using remote um, camera capture, we do use uh, solar power and solar power with like a small, um, uh, you know, what was it? 20 volt battery or 20, 12 volt battery. Basically, you just like put the battery inside of the um, the casing and let the solar power power that battery, and that can last you forever. Um, the camera itself doesn't have a huge draw, and especially when you're shooting time lapses, which are just single frames, you can disable the LCD monitor, um, and that's going to allow you to capture an infinite a number of frames. Um, you can also use power banks as well, and I've done that for like you know two or three day shoots, and I will say like that's probably the easiest and most convenient way to do it because you can easily capture. Um, multi days with just a single power bank if you're using, um, you know, a, a Sony A1 or an A7R5 or anything in between. Okay. And I'm going to sneak one last question here. And if anybody has any, want to sneak anything in by the time I sneak get my question in. out, then then sneak it in. We have all, all Drew's information uh, up there. But am I the only negative Nancy out here that's just constantly thinking, well, what if like somebody hits the camera or is this one of those? With doing time lapses, and again, I haven't tried it, if something hits the camera, if it slightly gets knocked ajar and you're halfway through, is it a wrap? It's a wrap, son. Uh, yeah, no, that's probably the most frustrating thing about time lapse is literally any vibration, any movement, anything that changes the position of the camera or the sensor, you've pretty much trashed your entire shot. Doesn't matter what you do. Now, there's there's ways that you can try to go back and fix it, but the problem is, is as soon as that plane on the sensor changes, even just a fraction of a millimeter, you try to fix that in post and it just it just doesn't work, unfortunately, because the whole um, angle view changes and it just looks wonky. So if you mistakenly hit the tripod, the lens, the body, unfortunately, you have to restart. And I, can, I can't tell you how many times that's happened during like actual productions. Um, I'll recant a really quick story. I know that we're out of time, but we were in China shooting and we had set up for this six hour shot going from day to night. And uh, I was on a motion control slider and we were about 50%, maybe 60% of the way through. And one of our PAs came over and literally leaned on the motion control rail. And it's like, oh, this is a cool shot. And literally the producers freaked out. And uh, I was like, yeah, we're, this shot's done. We're, we're out of here <laughs> after spending about four out of the six hours there already. So it was, it was not a good time. So always make sure that once your time lapse is running, walk away, don't touch it and don't let anyone else touch it. <laughs> And I'm sticking to still photography. That's right. There you go. <laughs> Mr. Fincher. Sorry. I know we've been out here all day. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Fincher. I just got sick to my stomach for you. Just thinking about how, how much nerves you're out there shooting for some of the, the gigs you're doing. Yeah. I, no, uh, -uh. no, it's, uh -uh. it's definitely nerve wracking. Cause especially, and that's why you usually have multiple cameras. I'll always have at least three cameras rolling so that there's always a backup shot in some shape, way or form um especially with motion control but it never fails somebody always touches a camera or touches something and yeah it's pretty much game over at that point uh, well, drew i want to thank you i i am saying this in complete seriousness you're one of the people that keeps pushing the boundaries of what we can do you, you've done great things you continue to gr do great things you don't just rest on what we've done and 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 keep the status quo which i think that's awesome for our industry as we've seen social media is changing AI is just introducing a whole new world. So we need the forward thinkers like you that constantly keep pushing the creative boundaries forward. So I want to thank you and thank you, Sony, for, for hosting this wonderful event. Yeah, thank you, Eric. I really appreciate it. And uh, again, wonderful talking with you uh, and good luck with everything you're doing. I've been checking out your work, by the way, and your marathon running and all that other fun stuff that you're up to uh, and keep it going, all right? Thank you, man. Always a pleasure to have you on and to all of our viewers out there, no matter where you're joining us from. Huge thank you to you as well. We do this all for you guys. So. Keep along, pushing the boundaries and free learning with the event space. But that's all we have for now. Another round is in the books. Catch you all next time.